It is a great honor and a privilege to introduce Miriam Factor, and your maiden name was Rukheimer. We are here in your beautiful apartment in Jerusalem. And Miriam, if you could tell us a little bit about your family, being born in Holland and coming to Israel. Yes, okay. And the Shoah. Yeah. Okay, so it's it's working. Okay. I, uh, oh, in English, okay. I'm Miriam Factor Righeimer. I was born in Amsterdam on the 6th of September 1943. When I was three weeks old, we, my parents were taken together with my two older brothers. They knocked on the door and slept my father downstairs with my brother. My older brother was born before, before the war in 38, my second brother in 42, in January 42, and I was born in 43. My mother was just, just nursed me and my father was downstairs already. And they just took me out of the arms for my mother when she was holding me and threw me out of the window from the second floor down. My father was downstairs holding my two brothers and he said it was the Malach that told him to stretch out his hands and he caught me. So that is, that's a nice entrance into the world, right? Who, to start who, like who that. Who threw you down? The Nazi, because why would they take a baby? Why would they let a baby live, a three week old baby? For what? So they threw me out and in the hope that I would splatter, but they did succeed, did they? So that my mother must have screamed, of course she screamed. And my father just because he said there was this malach that told him to stretch out his arms and he just caught me. An angel, it was a nice, yeah, a miracle. Better, better, better. Of course, so we went in Amsterdam, there was a a certain section in the middle of town that was where all the Jews from all of Holland had to get there and then they were going to either Westerbork which is a concentration camp on the border of Holland and Germany on the east or to Furt which is was in the south which is also connected to Germany and 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 Holland and they were decided you know you go there you go there you go there you go there we left on the 29th of September we were taken when I was three weeks old. Why did it take, first question, why did it take till the 6th of October that we got arrived in Westerbork? Where were they? A train doesn't take that long. Walking you can do it in, in six or seven days. Why? No answer. No answer to that. In any case, um, when it was, it was very hard. I have some letters that my father wrote to a neighbor in Amsterdam, from Amst from Westerbork, that he asked for clothing for me because it was so freezing cold there. And there was not enough to eat, and my father had given him uh, that he could take out money, then you could still take out money from the bank. It was a neighbor who lived on top of us. A Jewish neighbor? No, or? no, not Jewish neighbor. Uh, I'll tell you that afterwards. Um, and I, and, I, uh, and he did, he brought it over himself, he could only take it till the entrance of the camp, because he was not a Jew, so he was not allowed in, and then really one of the guards brought it to my parents, the parcel. They did bring it to the, to, to the parents, whatever was in there was in there, I mean I have the letter, somewhere, copy from the letter. Uh, at a certain point, there was a... Uh, they came in. There were 70 mothers and 70 babies sleeping in the same in the same hall. One day, they came in the evening and they said there is something new. There is a kind of a milk, and if we give the milk to the babies, they will sleep the whole night. And then the, the mothers have more power to work during the day. They have more strength to work during the day. My mother said no. She said she will not give the milk. Not to me and not to my brother who was then a year and a half or a year and eight months, something like that. She will not. And there was another mother who had a little boy. And she also said she will not give the milk. Then all the other mothers gave the milk and the babies we were, they were just, they was poisoned. So the babies were all, that was it, the end of the babies. And uh, I was, my mother attached me to her for two and a half years on a court either in front of her, wherever she went, wherever she slept, wherever she worked, she would not let go of me because they were going to lynch me, you know, because I survived. I didn't, I, my mother didn't give me the milk. 
but during the years I just go forward a minute to something that happened uh, about 25 years ago. No, yeah, something like that. I got a tele and sometimes I would think I knew the story for my mother, but only I knew that story after my eldest son was born. Because then it was very, very hot. He was born in Elul, which is September, and it was very, very hot. And in the Patralav, that's uh, for the children, for babies, they said then that we should give him some water, boiled water that is cooled down. My husband went to the super farm and he bought a bottle of bottle and then we sterilized it and we wanted to give the water to my son. And my mother jumped up and threw the bottle out of my hands. No bottle in the house. It brought her back. All the memories. From then. And only then she told me the story about the bottle, about the milk. Uh, and sometimes throughout the years I wondered what happened to this little boy. Did he survive? His father got murdered in the street because he was walking on the pavement and instead of in the gutter, so they just shot him. He was as a baby in the, in, an, in the pram and his mother, they were pushing him and the father was walking in, on the street next to his wife and you should walk in the gutter, so they just shot him. Uh, and, but 25 years ago, approximately, I got a, a telephone call from somebody, from somebody, and she said there is a symposium in Tel Aviv. They want to see what is happening, how the war influenced the people that were little children, from babies till the age of four, four or five, when you have already memories. I have no memories at all. I don't know anything, but I know I know through my mother. And... Uh, I said I didn't want to go. I get two weeks ahead, I get a migraine, and two weeks afterwards I have to say, and I, I hide behind my eldest son. I said, he doesn't want me to go. So she said, okay, this woman said, I can understand. Can you tell me a story? And I tell her the story from the milk. And it is quiet on the other side. I said, are you still there? She said, yes. I said, don't tell me that is your, your husband, that baby. She said, no, it's not my husband, but yesterday evening I spoke to somebody in the north of the country uh, who was a baby, a, a Dutch who was a baby in the time, and he was asking, uh, he said he wasn't going to come. It doesn't give him anything and he doesn't want to have anything to do with that and let me alone. And I asked him to tell him a story, if he has a story, and he told her the story from the milk. And he was saying that sometimes he's wondering, you know, what happened to this little baby girl? Is she alive? Did she make it? What happened? You know, but we, I didn't have a name and he didn't have a name. How do you look for somebody? So I said to this, to this woman over the phone, give me his telephone number and I will, I will phone him. She said, no, 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 you come to Tel Aviv and I will phone him and he will come to Tel Aviv and you can meet him there, which of course I did and he was there. You know, it's a, so that is really a closure. That was really, you know, closure. I know who he, I don't know, I forgot his name, but I know, I see him from in front of me. I, you know, he has also four children and it was that. So that is, that is one thing. I was at, back to 43. My mother uh, carried me around wherever she went for two years, two and a half years, everywhere. Uh, they came, one a Nazi came up to my mother and he said, which is also very, very surprising, she could choose. She wants to go to Sobibor or she wants us to go to Auschwitz. You can choose. My, so my mother said, Mr. Hotspur, you know, I'm not going anywhere. We're not going anywhere. And this Nazi said, okay, and he turned around and he walked away. Now, if you are not on the train with five people, that takes somebody else is five people. There is no choice there. The train has to be, the numbers have to be there. I never spoke to my mother about that. I never, don't know what, she said, we're not on the train, we're not going anywhere. We stayed in Westerbork. Uh, we stayed in Westerbork and then one day there was again, we, had, we were on the list to Auschwitz and my mother said, we're not going. We're not going, why, what? Again, you're not going, you know? Again, you are not going to say no. That no, my son has polio. My eldest son has polio. He did not have polio. He did not have polio. 
Two days later, he got the polio. Two days later, he had the polio. He was the first one in the camp. So, of course, we were not on the train. They wouldn't, because they were afraid it's catching, polio is catching. Uh, he was the first one together with either Italy. There uh, was a, a lady from, uh, who was born in The Hague, was, was said it doesn't So they were the first one who had polio and it really spread in the camp. It was really, they kept it very, uh, so my mother said no. Then, for whatever reason, I really don't know, I mean, it saved his life, but now that he is 84, the polio came back. You know, he is, as the doctor say, a disease that was not treated, the body does not forget. It comes back when you are older. That was one thing. Did you that ever ask your mother why did she choose polio? She could have said. She could have said. She could have said anything, but she said he has polio. He can't go. And two days later, he got it. He had polio. Yeah. So we grew up. You never tell a lie that you were sick. You don't feel like going to school. You tell me you don't feel like going to school. You don't tell me that you have. It hurts you here, it hurts you there, it hurts you there. We don't say that. You say, I don't feel like going to school. And I will accept that. You know, not when you have a, a test or not when you have a, uh, when you go on a trip or not when you go. That was a whole list where we could not go say that. But in principle, that's what we could say. I don't think we took advantage of it. I can't remember that. I said to my children the same thing. Never ever tell me that you have that you have this or you have that because it gets all hurt up there it's no we don't do that for whatever reason in 1944 uh, in, in, in the 4th of the 4th of march in 1944 and i'll show you this there was a transport there was a, a uh, trans not how you call it, trans no, it's not a transaction, it was, uh, you know, exchange of people between, from, from Germans against Dutch people, from Westerbork. Why were we on the list, out of the list from, there were, here, this is the name that we were, uh, my mother on her, under her maiden name, and this is the five, the four of us, and my mother was there on the front, we never know. Why they why they put us on the on the list? And we, my parents went to France. We went to France. They were in Vittel, which was um, which was uh, a work camp, I think. I think it was for women only, but I'm not quite sure because they separated my father from the family. He had to go to Labourbourg. I think he went to Labourbourg or the other way around. That he stayed in Vittel, and we moved. He moved, but I don't know. How and what, and uh, somehow we came through. Somehow we came through. When France was liberated, there was somebody else together with my father. My father knew where, where we were, but my mother did not know where my father was. They, she did not know where they took him to when they separated. And they were... So my father told the other fellow who was leaving already to get to his wife, who was in the same camp as my mother, so he said, so take, take a pedic for my, for my wife and tell her that I, she should stay where she is and I will get to her. Otherwise they miss each other on the way. Which is what she did. She waited, took about three weeks, four weeks till my father turned up. In that time, my mother wanted to give something to my father. She wanted to give him a present. Now there was nothing that she had as a present. There was nothing. What can you give somebody who is in... So as he found a stone, a black st a stone that could color, and she had a kind of a diaper, a piece of cloth from me, and she made a draw. She made a drawing, the coloring, the the the, um, the embroidery she did after the war, but this was the original picture that she had made instead of flowers. There were no flowers there that she could give to my father. So it's uh, I don't know. Can you see it? It's beautiful. And after the war, my father wanted, uh, she wanted to throw it out. Because this was a kind of a diaper that was from me. And she just drew it. She was very artistic, my mother. And after the war, so she wanted to throw it out. And my father asked her if she would, you know, go over it and embroider it. So that's what she did. It always hang in my parents' bedroom. Now it is at my daughter's house. Because, I mean, I have no room here where we are. 
but um, so that is really that was really very touching we grew up I just want to go back after the war my father not talking because there was nothing to say and we were not allowed to laugh because there is nothing to laugh we were five kids by then my sister was born oh by the way I jumped back they would let my father into Holland after the war in 45 40 the end of 45 when they finally managed to get to the border the, the, the border from Belgium and, and Holland, I think it was there. They were there. My mother was in that meantime, she was pregnant for my sister. And they uh, would not let my father in. My father, my father was born in Germany. And in the First World War, he, he and his father moved to Antwerp because my father was born in Antwerp in 1896. Uh, they would not let my father into Holland. So they stayed at the border till was more text time till my mother had to give birth. And my mother said, "If you don't let us in, I go to the to, I go to the press." So they moved back into Holland in March '46, beginning of April for something. End of March, beginning of April. My sister was born on the first of May in '46. I say that my father was as uh, as profession he was in diamonds. When he went back to the diamond exchange in 46, 47, there was nobody left. They, there was nobody left. He went on a Sunday because it was always closed on Shabbat. And Sunday said it was over. He went on a Sunday. And my mother came back. He came back. If this was my father, he came back like a broken man. Like that. There was nobody, nobody left. There was nobody left, and it was a it was a big trade. It was a, the big trader, the diamonds in 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 Holland, in Amsterdam then. So that was that was that. Uh, that we were not allowed to laugh, and we were not allowed to. My father walked in the house at 5:30, pooped every day. When he finally in 48, my mother managed to convince him that we needed money and that we had to start go working again. Blah blah blah. He did go back then to work and he started, of course, the safe deposits in that were in the bank. The first thing when he walked in, the bank that is now the Amro Bank, then it was the Amsterdam Bank, the Amsterdam Bank. He, first of all, he got a bill to pay that he didn't pay two and a half years, the rent for the safe deposits. The, they had here the, the uh, how do you call it, a safe deposit, safe, safe for, for his business. And this was during the war? That was during, during the war he didn't pay, right? He wasn't there. Where did he have money from? So he first had to pay, but he couldn't get into, his, into the bank account because he didn't have any papers left. I mean, you can say you are Mr. Cohen, you know, you can say anything. So my father said, I'll give you all the details. First you have to pay. First you have to pay the two and a half years rental that you didn't pay plus the class, plus, uh, plus, plus the fine. and. We all think about it, we go up. Okay, he managed to get that sorted out that once he starts working and try explain that. You know, that once I start working and I can pay back, I will pay you the two and a half years. Right now you have the money, I can't get it out. It's unbelievable, unbelievable. In any case, he did go, he did go back to work and uh, he paid his debt to the, to the bank. He paid the two and a half years only I mean, my father was dead already for, he's passed away 60 years ago already. And uh, then they, we received a letter. My mother had also passed away already. We received a letter from the bank because then it came in from the, by law, from the Dutch government, that uh, all the people that had debts to the banks because they weren't there and after the war they couldn't get at the money that they have to get, they have to pay a kind of, whatever money, whatever. So my brother went there, my older brother, and he said, I don't want the money back from the safe deposits. I want what was in there. I want money that was in there. Of course he didn't get it, because how do you prove what was in, in the safe deposits? You know, it's... So that we didn't get, but I said, okay. I, as a child, I always wanted to go to Israel. I can remember sitting at my father's chair next to his desk in 48, 
en listening to the Gazette Medina, uh, the proclamation of Israel in 1948, that came out on the Sunday. There was no direct thing. And I got up and I said to my father, that is where I'm going. And he looked at me and said, Kinderspiel. She doesn't know what she's talking about. She's going there. Where, what is there? I said, that's where, we, that's where I'm going. Well, here I am. I did. I had to make quite a few big decisions. I, when I left school, I was almost, when I finished Bakrute, matriculation, matriculation uh, whatever you call it, uh, I was 16 and a half because I quit Kitan Bet because I was so bright then, you know? <laughs> One of those things that they let you go. Uh, and I wanted to be a judge. A judge, not a lawyer, I wanted to be a judge. And my father said, we, I will pay for it, I will pay for the studies, but you have to promise me not to, that you don't go to Israel. Was he afraid that you were going to just be uh, separated? He, I don't know. I don't know. He said the price was too high for the Medina. It was too high. I, you know what? I remember running with my mother on Sundays because the lists came out from people who had returned. My mother, she would, why she would always take me and not one of my brothers? She took me by the hand and we had to run because otherwise the list, I don't know why we had to run, but she was so much, you know. So, okay. So my sister came back and one of her brothers came back. Uh, tough. Okay, some of them came back, but it is always the lachats. My father, if a car would stop in the evening, when it was dark, would stop in front of the house, he was under the table. He was under the table. We never had a telephone because he couldn't listen to the sound of it for, you know, that, that would remind him of whatever. Uh, in any case, I started working then in, in, because I wasn't much of a choice for me. I never felt at home in Holland. I really never felt at home. In, I felt always an outsider. I, uh, so when, my, when yeah. you went back to school after the war, did you go to a Jewish school or was there it was a public no, school? There were no Jews. What do you mean a Jewish school? I had a teacher, a certain anti-Semit. You will not keep that for you. You know the story, Mia. You will not, you don't believe it. He was a teacher in English and in mathematics. The same teacher. He was this, um, uh, the second of, uh, in, in, uh, in chess from Europe. The, he was this gun, the, you know, the, in playing chess from, in the competition. I did never, I never understood, you know, go from here for, with the triangle, I never understood it. He would pick on me. Every day we had mathematics, he would call me for English. He wouldn't call me for English because my languages were okay. We had to do all the languages. That was okay. He would pick on me. Every day I had to go to the front of the class in the blackboard, if you are allowed to say the blackboard and not the whiteboard or the green board, whatever. And he would just start making fun of me. Now we were 52 students in the class. 52, one teacher. One day he walks in, the boys were sitting in front, the girls were sitting at the back. I was sitting at the very back. And every day he called me and then he would say, I told you that she is stupid, she doesn't know. One day he comes in and he says he, in, he is in a bad mood. I get on my heart from this story. And he said to, he said to everybody, Nobody will talk. We were nine, ten years old, approximately. I was Kita Hey, I must have been nine, nine or ten. Nobody will talk. The first one who talks gets punished. This teacher says, I did not talk. I did. Not. Seventy years later, I can tell you, I did not talk. He said, I talked. Mrs. Finger, come to the front of the class. I had to stand in front of the class. I had to put my hands on the blackboard, the green board, the white board, low put, and he started hitting me. With a stick, he had the stick. Bang, bang, bang. I did not cry. I did not cry. I did not scream. I did not give him the pleasure. And he hit me, 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 and he hit me. Till somebody screamed, enough, enough, enough. 
It could have been the childhood, the boy, because there was a boy who said, who, who said something that he said that I said. I did not say it. I did not talk. He went and it got him out of his trance or whatever you call it, you know, he stopped. He told me to go and sit down. I went to sit down. Now at 10 o'clock, this was at 9 o'clock in the morning, at 10 o'clock there is a break and everybody has to go and play outside. I sat down and I tried to get up from the seat and I'm stuck to the seat. I can I was bleeding but I didn't know that. I was 10 years old or nine. I didn't know how to go like that. I couldn't get up from the seat. So I went to sit down. He comes back in the classroom and he says to me, I told you to get out. I got up and now I was stuck to it. So whatever was bleeding again, was healing again, opened up again, right? So I went out and I stood in the chatzer till the bell went and we went back in. 12 o'clock, there was a break, everybody went home. There is, you go home for lunch. And I had to go home with my brother. My brother was a year and a half older because we had to cross over a main road. I was not allowed to do that. We go there and he walks with a friend behind me. I walked very, very slow because it was hurting me. But I didn't tell anything to my brother. And we walk, we walk slowly. and. And then he said, no, come on, come on, come on, come on already. And he sees that I'm brown at the back, on my skirt. So he said, what, you made in your pants? I am not going to hold your hand when we cross over, blah, 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 blah. He's not going to, hey, it's a bush shot. But what, what, how do you call bush shot? Um, uh, embarrassment. Embarrassment, you are embarrassing me, I'm not going, what is this? In any case, of course, he gave me a stick and I could hold on to that and he held on on that side. He wouldn't touch me. Now I didn't say anything to him that what had happened. My mother always stood in the entrance of the house waiting for us. He went towards my mother. He said she had made in her pants and don't tell me that I have to take her back home to back to school again. My mother looks at me she said what happened and then I started crying. I said he hit me and then she st I started crying. Tough my okay he then never went back to school again, this teacher, because zero. They went to the police, there was a was police case, he, I mean, he lost his job, I mean, what kind of business is that, right? Okay, that was my experience from school. In any case, I always wanted to get to Israel. And, yes? Is there, did you have uh, any other Jewish children in, in your class? There were no Jews. There were no Jews. There you was one girl that had a Jewish father. Okay, and it was, there were no Jews. And did you, did you make friends with the non-Jewish children? I had, she was my friend. She was my friend. And I had another girlfriend whose father was in the police, but he was in the underground. So I could play with her. And we had a whole list that we could not play with this girl. And we could not play with that girl because her father was in jail and he was in jail and he was in jail and he was wrong and he was wrong. And we were not allowed to do anything of that. And uh, an interesting story, there, there came um, a fun park, how do you say, like, uh, with that they have machines that you can pull the button and then you find, uh, you get the price if... Okay, if public amusement. Yeah, pop, amusement park. They were building that on the Friday, on a Friday afternoon. And I wanted to go and see it. And my mother said, no, we will go on Sunday. When it is finished, it's not a place for you to go. Okay. I asked permission to stand on Shabbat on Shabbat outside the house. I mean, I was brought up very, I wasn't allowed anywhere. Everywhere where I went, I got brought, my brothers had to pick me up, my brothers had, my father picked me up, my mother picked me up, my brother picked me up, I always, I mean, I was really brought up like that. I was the Yosef in the family, if you know what that means. The spoiled one, I was always right, commissioner. Uh, in any case, the friend that I was allowed to talk to was walking down the street to the girl I was not allowed to talk to. They walked and the friend that, that the girl that said to me when they passed me, she said, come along, we are going to the amusement park on Shabbat. We are going to the amusement park. I said, no, I'm not going because I can't go, right? My father said, no, so I can't go. I said, no, come on, come on, come on, we won't tell your parents this is what I said, how am I going to go? I'm not allowed to, go to talk to this other girl. How am I going to go? But then there is that the pressure from the friends. And I said, okay, 
I'll walk with you, but I don't have any money. It doesn't matter, we will give you the money. They tell me. I said, well, this other girl that I'm not allowed to talk to said, I'll give you 10 cents. I didn't take it, the 10 cents. In any case, we come, I go, I step along like that behind them. I wasn't walking next to them, I walked behind them. And we come to this park. We crossed over the road that I was not allowed to cross over. Count all the, <laughs> all the things I did on that Shabbat was I not allowed to do. And the first amusement thing that is there that you have to pull on the lever and then all the balls start running and if you have it and it comes out the price. This fellow who stands in the middle there calls out to me and said you stand here because there is still a place left. I said I don't have money to pay. I'm not standing here. I said you stand here we worry about the payments afterwards. I said I'm not going to I don't have money. I can't play. I don't have money to pay you. He convinced me I should play. I pulled that worker and I have the, the main prize. A doll, a walking doll with blue eyes and blonde hair. She was wearing a light blue dress. How I'm going to accept that doll? How I'm going to accept that doll? How am I going to tell my father? Somebody gave it to me? I mean, <laughs> I did not tell. And then this girl that I was not allowed to talk to, I can't even remember her name. She said, give it to me, give it to me. I, I don't have a doll either. Give it. I said, I'll give her a doll. If I can't talk to her, I'll give her the doll. No, I don't. I did not. I walked, turned around and I walked back. I walked back on myself. Sunday comes and my mother said, are we going to the amusement park? I said, no, there's not much to do. Let's not go. I don't think it's too noisy. We did not go. But that taught me. <laughs> and what happened to the doll? You just left it? I left the doll, the doll there. Yes, I didn't take it. I didn't pay for it. I didn't take it. So it's... Uh, <laughs> And but where can I ask from your yeah. parents? Were they many generations in, in Amsterdam or in Holland? Well, from my father's side, no. But on your mother's from side? From my mother's side, I think they came from the Inquisition, from Portugal. Because somewhere we had a, um, how do you call it? Ilan, Ilan, we had seen, we had it made. Like a family tree. Yeah, 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 fa family tree. And there was a Portuguese name in there. Now, I don't know if somebody married her and that's why she came on the family. That is back at the end of the 1600s. Max van Dam did that, so I really don't know. My mother was born there, her parents were born in, in Holland, in Amsterdam, and for generations they and were there. Was it always a religious observant family? No, yes they were, yes they were. My mother after the war didn't want to have anything to do with Jadut. And your father? My father didn't argue with my mother about that. He told me, when I asked he would tell me stories about Tanakh, Torah, he would tell me stories, he would, he would tell stories, but he also took me to a Hanukkah party, me on my own, why only me and not my brothers or my sister, I don't know, but I remember he put me down in that, was in a big hotel in Krasnopolsky, you remember the hotel yeah, yeah, yeah. there, a big hotel and I was petrified that he would leave me alone, he said, I sit here, I will not move, but I can't go in, they wouldn't let him in, because it was only for children. And the parents were outside. He was not on his own, but I, you know, the same. And did you have like Pesach or? We had Pesach, a kind of. My mother did all kinds of funny things. She wouldn't go to the kosher butcher. She went to the butcher next door, but she kosher to meat. <laughs> you know, she put it in water, she put it in salt. Oh, but uh, you know what I mean? She always, the, the, uh, how do you call chassa? Uh, lettuce. The lettuce he would put in, in vinegar and she would let it soak and then she would wash it out. You know, things she like... She the tradition. She, she did. Out. Some, some little bit. There was a Raaf in Holland who came back. Uh, I think his whole family, he came back on his own. He remarried in, uh, in Holland. And he came every Sunday. He rang the doorbell. If you could take my brothers for an hour and they would try and get a little bit of Yahadut. Every week my mother said no. No, 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 no. It didn't do any good. No, 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 no. One week and he came at a quarter to twelve, this fellow. Every week. <laughs> every week he came. He knocked on the door. Every week. Every week. And every week my mother said no, 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 bye bye. Bye bye. <laughs> One day, either he came early or he came late, 
I don't know. In any case, my father opened the door and he said, Mr. Brigheimer, I want to take your sons. What time are you bringing them back? He said, in an hour and ten minutes. Because the shoe was then, they was, what they're doing was uh, an hour and ten minutes to take them back. How many boys were there? Four boys. He said, my father, just take them. Take them. Oof. You know? <laughs> and that was it. When I was 11, I became uh, Jose Rebetshuva. I had to, uh, I started asking questions. I asked questions and I, my father gave me the telephone number from the Rabbanut in Amsterdam that was there. And I said, I went to a teacher and I started learning. And here and, I am. And your brothers and sisters, were they interested as well? My sister became Jose Rebetshuva when I, well, I was already in Israel. She came here to visit and she stayed for three or four months, I don't remember. We lived in the same, we, I had a room, it was not an apartment, I had a room with an old lady. Uh, so she joined in there and uh, uh, she got married with, yes, with a from fellow. My youngest brother also, my eldest brother married somebody who was a little girl, came back by herself, didn't have anybody. No parents, no grandparents. She was the only child from her parents because the father was 24 and the mother was 23 or the other way around. And they were both up in, in Sobibor, her grandparents, that everybody, everybody went. And her mother had put her under the sink with a bottle of water, with a bottle or something, something like that, bottle of water. And she said, don't cry. That she remembers that because she was about three years old then, my sister-in-law. And when they had taken the family away, the neighbors came and they opened the doors and they, f and they found her and somebody took her out and I said, uh, she had a hell of a life. She, she really did. So she married my brother and they married, uh, how long? 62, 63 years right now. So, uh, yes. In any case, I wanted to go to, I, after high school, I jump a little bit, but after high school, when my father gave me the choice, either I st start studying, go to the university, or I have to start working. So I started working, because he also told me he won't pay for me, for going to Israel, because he doesn't agree. Again, because it was, the price was too high. There's no arguing about that, I mean, okay. But then when I came on Aliyah in 65, that's 58 years ago. Hosh Chodes Tamus. I arrived, Lamet Sivan. Vizel. How old were you when you came? 21. And did you have any... I didn't know anybody. Any connections, any family, friends? Eh, for family. I didn't know a single person in the country. I went to Ulpan Akiva in Atanya. That is a story by itself. I went to, I had enrolled in uh, Tanya had started learning Hebrew when I was in Amsterdam. I found the same lady who was with my brother, he had polio with my brother. <laughs> so she taught them and then she started teaching me Hebrew. Uh, we stayed, till she passed away, we stayed very close. We really stayed very close. Uh, uh, what was I saying about... Uh, I lost track. And, and you learned in... Oh yeah, I went to, I went to Upan Akiva for four and a half months. Now what do I know? about Ulpan Akiva. They sent me for a package like that on papers that I had to sign, medical, that I don't have police, that I don't have this, that I studied school, that I blah, 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 and hala bahala. And I paid for four, it was a private Ulpan, I paid for four and a half months. I did not know that every third Shabbat they closed the Ulpan. Like in the Yeshivot, they closed the Ulpan and everybody goes to family. Where am I supposed to go to? The first Shabbat that I was there, or the third Shabbat. Friday I see everybody packing up. Where am I going to? So, I, first of all I asked the other girls in the room, well, what happens, what happens, I didn't know. I said, well, I go to a, a cousin, because nobody had really family. When they came from Europe, nobody had, had really family here. But I go to this and I go to that. I said, so what am I supposed to do? Well, you have to leave, we lock the door. We lock the doors in the Upan. I went to the Minahelet, I won't say a name because, okay, in that time I said, well, what am I supposed to do? I said, I don't believe you that you don't have family. I said, you never heard that there was a war in Europe? She said, okay, you can stay. She gave me something to eat, you can stay, but I have to lock the doors. I stayed in the room by myself, me and the Jukim. Me and the Jukim. 
I thought I must have screamed, hell, I was, where is now, Rogov Shlomo HaMelech in Atanya? It's right across from, uh, the Upan was then right across from Kiryat Sands, because I saw that he started building Kiryat Sands in 65. Uh, so, that was the first week. Then I wrote to my mother what happened, to tell her what happened, and then the post, the postal services worked, <laughs> because they, uh, and she phoned this, la this friend, this teacher that I had, and who had a friend in, she phoned where the, the lady that I, where I, I made a mistake, I didn't go with her, I went to a friend of her in Amsterdam to, to, for uh, Hebrew lessons, so my mother asked her if she knew anybody in Tel Aviv, it was this teacher, this woman who had polio together with my brother, so she said I could always come to her, she never married, but uh, because she was invalid, and uh, I, I went to I Amis mean, really till the day she passed away, we were very close, I was also uh, her apotropus, because she also didn't have any family. So you from your mother's side and your father's side, did any family members survive? Yes, my mother's sister, my mother's eldest brother. Not the eldest brother, no, he was on the first train out. He, he, what a bit, he sent a card to my mother on his way to Auschwitz. And he said, Leah, remember us. We are going and it is not a good place. And she got it and somebody delivered it to my mother. She had the letter. I don't know, I didn't find it after my mother passed away. I went through her papers looking for this stupid piece of paper. Not a stupid, I wanted that card. I wanted that postcard or piece of paper that he had that he threw out of the train. I wanted to have that. I didn't find it. I didn't find it. After my father died, my mother threw almost everything that had to do with the war, she burned. All the papers, all the, she burned. She couldn't take it anymore. It was too painful. It was yeah, too of course it was too painful for her. It was too painful for her. And she burned. So she must have burned that as well. But I saw it. She showed it to me. As a child, she showed me what her brother Benjamin had written to her. Oh, well, that's the way it is. What can I tell you? But here we are. And when you decided to become more religious, how did your parents react? Oh, my father was not alive then already. Uh, my mother said, okay, but, but, uh, so she started buying meat for me and she gave me a saucepan and she cooked for me separate. She cooked for me separate then and beside her. And then she decided, well, it's a bit stupid to go from one butcher to the next butcher, right? <laughs> so she started buying already. And then my sister became religious when we were older already. I was beside her. And then she did chuba. Mr. Ford, she did chuba and she became Shomer Shabbat. Your mother? My mother, yes. My mother. And she became? Wow. Yeah, she became Shomer Shabbat, yes. Chabad held them kosher in the kitchen for her and throw out but had to be thrown out and... <laughs> yeah. They put her a time clock. She was living there, of course, she, was, she never remarried. My mother never remarried. She was widowed for a long, long, many, she, many, many she years. she remained in Amsterdam? She remained in Amsterdam, yes. And Marin Klaus, was it very difficult being in Amsterdam knowing that you pass a certain home and you know that they, they actually informed on Jews or... I tell you something, it was so difficult that you, we had a list who we could talk to and, who we could, and where we could buy as children. Okay? My father had made a list, that, that's why I know I couldn't talk to her, but I could go talk to the girl who lived below them. And I couldn't talk to the fellow next door because he was in jail and he was wrong. I didn't even know what, mean, uh, they, they, what, what it meant to be wrong. What, what do you mean by being wrong? What is, they, they had to birth for care, which is your fault, they were faulty. So I didn't even know what it meant. I didn't even know. I can tell you a short story. I don't know how much longer you have. I went to ballet lessons and there was, uh, I wanted that, or my mother wanted it, I don't know, whatever. And I must have been about six years old and my mother, and then there was a whole, there was going to be, uh, uh, you know, we were going to dance on, on, on the podium, all those girls. My mother was a seamstress, she did, she did uh, sewing, one of the seamstresses for the, for Queen Guillemina, still, the old, old, old queen. So she knew what she was doing, so she said she didn't want to pay for a dress that somebody else was making, she will make it for me. 
and it will turn out exactly the same. It would be every. No, this woman had to make it. This woman, everybody had to go there. My mother went along with that. We go up there. See, we stand in front of the door, and my mother says to me, "There was a mezuzah on this door." I had taken off, but you could see that there was a mezuzah on this door. She rang the bell and she looks and she looks and said, who, and she's trying to work out who lived here because I was in the same neighborhood where my parents lived before the war. She couldn't work it out who lived there. I think at the end she did. She did find out where it was. And the woman <sighs> opens the door and we go in there and she sees standing there two candlesticks. That size. And she sees there a menorah standing there. My mother said to her, uh, where did you get those from? My mother was like, oh, I got them. From who did you get them? They're not yours. Yes, yes, they, somebody gave them to me. Nobody gives things like that. They belong to the Jewish community. I was embarrassed from here till she didn't make the dress for me. She took me out from the school, she put on the complaint that that is where they have to go because they have stuff that belongs to the Jewish community. Mm. Now, I don't know if this person, if she bought it or if she hadn't bought it, it wasn't given to her. Things like that, nobody gave away. So, I, did, I had to leave the, the, the dancing class. I did not perform. I did. The Seder, Mr. In any case, on 65 I came on Aliyah. And what made you become so Zionistic? I think this is the country we have to live in. I think this was promised to us and this is what we should fulfill. That we should live here. And I married him and he is the same, the Zionist. He came in 1960, so... Did you belong to a youth no, movement? Or? No. Nothing that had anything to do with Jews. Nothing, nothing, when we were little. We knew we were Jews, because my brother got yelled that, my older brother, the Jew. There's the Jew. And yeah, this is after the war? Yeah, better after the war. And I just want to tell you, coming back to the family that did help my parents, and I said once to my mother when she came to visit, because afterwards she came to visit us very, very quite often, and I said to my mother, uh, well, we perhaps we should plant a tree in Yad Vashem for, Miss, for the family dapper. That was the name. And my mother said, mm, does not come into consideration. Now, I never knew what happened there. Why? But I know my mother told me when I was older, they had an older son. And this family wanted as a tashlum that I marry their son. So, of course. It's a payment. It's um, yeah, well, they also got paid. I know that. I know they got paid. I know that. I know that they got paid. Uh, so my mother said, of course, no, then, this, then this, the mother of this boy, this fellow, was very upset. But my son is not good enough for your daughter. <laughs> he said, it's not good, we are different. Doesn't go together. Doesn't go together. In any case, in 65, back, we, I met him, we married. Friends of us put us together. We have four children. We have 26 grandchildren. Right now we have nine Nini on the way, great grandchildren on the way, so I think we did a good job. You did amazing. All of ch our children, they stayed in Derecha Torah. The grandchildren are Derecha Torah, the ones that are married right now, right? We have ten married couples from the grandchildren. And then if I could ask you, what, what message do you impart to your children and grandchildren and to the future generations? I think first of all, you have to believe in what you do. And then you also get, you also have the strength to go through it. Because it was very, very difficult to be here on Israel on your own, being holidays on your own. I mean, I mean, the two years passed till I met him, you know, it's, uh, it's very, very difficult. And I, you have to stand up for principles, I think, and be strong. And it's, that's what I, yes. You have to stand up for it and suffer for principles. Now I'm not saying that I, because I came out earlier I suffered, but it was very, very difficult. If certainly in the beginning it was very, very difficult. They once sent me to a kibbutz because there was three weeks of uh, holidays from after the 9th of Av till Rosh Chodesh was holiday. Now where I'm going to go to? 
I paid for four and a half months in Upan Akiva. Where did I, where was I supposed to go to? They sent me through the Irgunay Holland to a kibbutz in the north of the country, Sedein Chemya, Kuliot. They made plastics there. I slept there by buses and whatnot. I was supposed to be there for three weeks. Uh, I stayed there three weeks. And I, I come there and I see nobody's wearing a kippah. So I asked one of the one of the girls there. I said, "This says that no, Mappy told me you're not a religious kibbutz. We are. So what I'm going to do with food? Where I'm going to go to? I ate for three weeks two slices of bread in the morning, a quarter tomato, and two slices of cucumbers. Morning, afternoons, and evenings. Shabbat." What say Shabbat Friday night? Lo meshane. That is what I had. Three weeks. I lost night quite some weight. I have to admit it. So it has a good size, but. And when, I have to ask you when, when you look back on, on on Holland, there were those that unfortunately informed, mm -hmm. and there's a very high percentage of Jews that was deported from Holland after the, the, after Litter, the, it's the second the, highest. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But, but there were know. also those righteous Gentiles that endangered their lives to also Yes, there were some. Yes, there were some. Yes, there were some. 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 And when you look back in Holland, do you look very fondly or no. do you visit? No. I never felt at all in Holland. I never felt at all. I was always an outsider. I was always an outsider. I... I... Mm. I never, I never felt at home. No. And can you as well? Do you feel at home? Sure, yeah. <laughs> what kind no. of a question is that? <laughs> no, After 58 you, years. <laughs> no, I totally agree. <laughs> that's uh, that's a silly question. <laughs> this is your home. This is our home for sure. Yeah. I told you we have one more stop to go after this. <laughs> <laughs> You'll be shut for many, many years. Yeah. Well, Marie, I just want to thank you. Okay. Uh, I, okay, I, I, now I see why the tour is. I, 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 everybody <laughs> felt that was a, a silly question, but Israel's very special. And it that is, you, yes. your whole story is so special. And miracles that your father put out his hands. Why did he put out I've his hands? I've never heard something. Why did he put out his hands? He, could, he had no explanation. He let go of my brothers. I mean, the other brother was a year. A year and, and three or four months, whatever he was like that and a boy of four or three and he let them go and he went like that and there came a little pekala. That's incredible. Well, thank God. <laughs> Baruch Hashim. Your, your story is just miracles yeah. after miracles and you are a miracle. Yes, well, and you should I just have so. you should have gesund and health thank and you. muzzle and bracha. Thank you. And may be yeah, and, okay. and no, all of Hashem's okay, blessing. No, Absolutely. <laughs> now, Miriam, we should just have just joy and happiness and just thank you very much. And thank you. Only nachis from your family. Only is impossible. Rough smachot, okay? <laughs> you can't have just smachot. Well, well, please God, your life should be filled with happiness and you yeah. deserve it. You really do. Yeah, thank you very much. And I really want thank to thank you. you so much. I hope I get a copy. This is such a beautiful picture. Yeah. This was made five years ago. Uh, we took the whole family that we had then to uh, to Niretzion in the north. We went for a few days when we were married 50 years. So I just want to wait one second. Sorry. Oh. So this is us. This is us, my husband, and that's me. This is our eldest son. This is wife. This is our second son. Where is Nachshon? This is my, our second son and his wife, our third son and his wife, and our daughter, who is still not married, okay? Not married yet. Not yet, right. Okay, uh, they have in the meantime, this is their eldest son, they have in the meantime three children, they have, they say, granddaughter and her husband have four children, a grandson and his wife have two children, he is married, he is married, he is married, she is married, she is married, she wow. is married. And there is a grandson who is not on here because he he wasn't he wasn't in the country at that time. And the rest are grandchildren. This is this is real Nachas. Ah uh, yes. That keeps us that keeps us on our toes. And can I ask where, what is your secret for <laughs> happy marriage after fifty years? Ah uh, give, well, give, give in, give in, give in, and he gives in and I take. <laughs> It's wonderful. It's not really like that, but it's 
live it there, you know, uh, just let to go compromise. to compromise. Compr uh, not compromise, do you agree with that? No. Yes. You There's nothing you wouldn't do for me. There's nothing you, you wouldn't do for me. For me. <laughs> so, so we don't, we don't do just anything. <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah, the, the, we are here, we are in Bay Bird, and he didn't want to come really. And I more or less thought of Ingi Asban, it was time to move on. And I didn't want to cook anymore, and I just, it yeah, was just getting too much for me. So, he got used to it now, more or less, a little bit. <laughs> well, <that's funny. laughs> it's, uh, well, we are here half a year, and uh, we are here to stay till we go out, feet first. <laughs> In many, many years to come. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. That's thank you so much. Okay, thank you. And this thank is really you. very beautiful. Thank you. Oh yeah, well, thank you. <laughs>